Good afternoon, and welcome everyone to this afternoon's lecture on the Arab world and economic transition by David Lipton, IMF's first deputy managing director. My name is Dan Kwa. I'm going to be chairing this event. I'm going to say a few words of introduction and then turn over to David. David has kindly agreed to have a quite extensive Q&A session after this lecture. So I hope that as we go along, we will be taking up the hard questions that LSE, the LSE community always throws at its speakers. Now obviously David is now at the IMF, but he also started there. Although in between, he's done a range of the top jobs in international economics and security. He's worked in the Treasury Department under the Clinton administration. He's worked at the National Economic Council and the National Security Council at the White House. He's worked at Citibank. He's worked at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's advised governments, notably not just in his current role, of course, at the IMF, but also previously, governments ranging from Russia to Poland to Slovenia. He will speak, and then we will take Q&A for about 20, 25 minutes. Since you are here, you already know that there are at least three things he's going to be talking about. The first is the short run, set of short run challenges in the Arab world in the wake of the Arab Spring. A set of short run challenges not at all helped by all of this occurring against the background of an anemic global economy in turn. We will look at that, but then we will also look at the more optimistic longer term growth opportunities with a focus on what rich economies can do to help. So without further ado, can I ask, can I ask you to help me welcome David to the podium? Changes that are going on right now in the Middle East. 
We're hard at work. We have teams that are engaged and deployed uh, to the region in a number of countries. So what I want to talk about today is what's really at stake for the people in the region, but also for the rest of us, for the rest of the world. No doubt, at the end of the day, the people in the region will make their own decisions about their futures, about the direction to take their countries, uh, about their destiny. But we all have a huge stake in how this turns out, in this success, this transition or transformation being successful. And I think there's a lot that we can do and should do to try to help. So I'm going to start by speaking about what the IMF is doing. Um, I will also argue, though, that the international community needs to resist the temptation, the understandable uh, preoccupation with the problems that it has at home in the United States and Europe. And at this difficult and important moment, uh, the international community needs to find ways to provide concrete support for the aspirations of the people in the Middle East and North Africa. The Arab Awakening started as a revolution with a single self-immolation by a street vendor in a small rural city outside of Tunisia, outside of Tunis. The following month, the call in Egypt for bread, freedom, and social justice echoed around the, much of the Arab world and excited observers everywhere. The mandate for change was political, but it was not just political. It extended deep, deeply into the economic sphere. People really wanted a say in how their countries were going to be governed, and they wanted greater opportunities for uh, prosperity, for personal, personal opportunities for fulfillment. Now, almost two years later, MENA's future seems rather unclear. In their recent article entitled, This is Not a Revolution, two prominent Middle Eastern scholars, Hussein Arda, who is here at Oxford, and Robert Malley at the uh, International Crisis Group in Washington, begin their paper with the assertion that, the Middle, that in the Middle East, history does not move forward and slips sideways. They say aloud what many of recent observers have been thinking, that the newly elected govern governments lack a clear direction in terms of the political and economic reform, that religious factionalism is reinforcing inaction. And they warn rather darkly that the fight for political power will block progress on political and economic reform. One could add that some have doubts about the pace and direction of reform in countries where the leadership has not changed. There are several reforming countries like that. To me, a, a useful way to think about the present situation is that the revolution in the region really could take any one of three alternative paths as far as the, the economic consequences of their future is concerned. You could call these paths deterioration, restoration, and transformation. First, we could see economic deterioration. If squabbling over political power prevents the stabilizing <coughs> stabilization of the country, let alone any steps forward to really change the way in which economies perform. Second, we could see stabilization achieved through a reassertion of the vested interests that uh, we see in the business community, uh, where the powerful people who were around the previous leaders offer to uh, come in and stabilize the situation. Uh, that might provide a respite from the eroding economic conditions. But it really would condemn the region to return to economic stagnation or at best tepid growth like they have had in the past decades. Or third, and obviously more desirably, we could see a new economy begin to emerge. If newly elected, if inexperienced governments gradually find a way to end the lingering economic disruptions coming from the revolution itself, and then begin to find ways to reform and open up economic opportunity for the people. Now, obviously, the two uh, first paths are undesirable, but I think they could come to pass. They actually uh, are, we, we, we face uh, the risk that they could come to pass. The third transformation would be best but it actually will be quite hard to achieve 
So I want to talk about those three uh, paths, talk about the prospects, uh, ask the question, what could we do to affect the outcome? First, let me provide a little bit of uh, background and context. MENA, the MENA region is a huge and economically varied region. We're talking about 20 countries with a population of 400 million people uh, that produces $3 trillion worth of GDP. So we're talking about 6% of the global population that produces only 4% of global GDP. Now, of course, as I said, the, the circumstances in these countries differ very substantially. As you know, some countries are oil rich and have uh, with vast oil and gas reserves. Uh, they have uh, the ability to take care of their citizenry. While others have less significant resource endowments and more challenges. But if there's one fact that I would like you to remember from my talk here today, just one simple fact, is that the non-oil exports of the entire region, of the 400 million people, is $365 billion. Now, to compare that, that's equivalent to the exports of Belgium, a country of 11 million, not 400 million. So why is that number so important? In answering, let me focus on the Arab countries in transition. So I have in mind Egypt, Jordan, Libya, Morocco, Tunisia, and Yemen. <coughs> These are all countries that have embarked on sub substantive political change, either through revolution or change from within. Long before people took to the streets, the Arab countries in transition face the challenge of employing rapidly growing, very useful population. And despite several rounds of reforms, their economies really were unable to generate enough jobs for the people, the young people entering the labor force. They <coughs> suffered from three related problems. First, there was a lack of openness to international trade. Trade might have generated more jobs than just producing for the home market, which is obviously more uh, limited. Second, governments were unable to create the infrastructure needed to support a more dynamic economy. In some countries, the energy and food subsidies were repeatedly increased to placate the rest of the populations who were concerned or complaining about the uh, strength of uh, the more authoritarian uh, governments. And so they avoided political challenge by handing over more subsidies. <coughs> but by building up the subsidies, they overstretched the budgets and really didn't leave enough resources for modernizing the economy. And third, in places where there were meaningful structural reforms and attempted, and there, there, there were some, Egypt in particular in the last decade before its revolution, there was a widely held perception that control over the investments in the new and reforming sectors remained in the hands of a very select elite people who were connected to the political leadership. In fact, now, looking back from after the revolution, research has gone back, researchers have gone back and shown that in fact, the stock prices of companies that were connected to the political leadership substantially outperformed all the rest during the periods of reform. So in a sense, the, I think these widely held suspicions were right. I mean, the research shows that the stock prices of connected companies went up by 20% more than the rest. The connected companies, of course, were able to get credit. They were able to gain market share. But they really weren't very big job creators because they weren't part of the international economy. And they were trying to, um, they were rent seekers trying to make profits rather than really build uh, global businesses. The evidence shows, furthermore, that once political leadership changed during the Arab awakening, those same companies lost more in value than the rest. They went down by 30%. So there was something to this fact that the reforms where they happened were not very inclusive reforms. Overall, these three factors uh, led to a lack of economic vitality in the region and left the region with very high uh, unemployment and very few job prospects for people coming out of school and joining the labor force. Egypt, in particular, has uh, a tranche of the 
young people very well educated who have a hard time finding jobs besides jobs in government. So coming back, the statistic I cited earlier, low non-oil exports, I take to be a crucial indicator of the nature and size of the structural adjustment problem that uh, countries in the region face. But ironically, I think it also is a, a fact that helps illuminate the way forward. Because to achieve broad-based and sustainable growth, the countries in, in the Middle East need to move away from state-dominated uh, economic industries to a private investment-based economy, away from protected industries with rent-seeking to export-led uh, companies and an export-led growth strategy, because that's where the jobs will be. To unlock the formidable growth potential, and there is the, the, the very uh, fact of uh, so many people unemployed, the idle resources that could be put to work uh, if they have uh, the infrastructure, if they have the capital, if they have the education, uh, shows that there is great potential in these things. But to unlock that potential requires uh, the private sector becoming the main engine of growth. And that's something that can only happen if countries in the region can access global markets, not just the home markets. So to achieve these goals, I think there are six areas where reform is necessary. But the list really starts and starts with and depends upon the first item, which is stronger trade integration. The overarching strategy to deliver economic growth on the scale and the timetable that would create enough jobs and enough prosperity uh, to satisfy the, the, the aspirations of people right now uh, is a strategy of economic integration. More trade integration would not only create jobs and growth, but I think it would importantly act as a catalyst for further reform. It would provide discipline and incentives to get the rest of the reforms right. If a country opens up to international trade, it will find that international competition uh, is something that affects everyone in the country. In essence, they will find a greater logic in all of the rest of the reforms that I'll, that I'll talk about, because they'll see that each of those reforms would help them compete internationally. So let me go through the rest of that. Countries in the region need to improve the business environment. Most countries have complex and burdensome regulations that themselves hold that job creation and growth. Take Egypt, for example. There's no less than 36,000 regulations now that pertain to the private sector. But Egypt's not the only country. It's something that you find across the region. Many of the new um, uh, political parties are grounded in support from people who run small businesses and who understand the need for small businesses to be able to work. The Muslim Brotherhood, for example, is really a party, and apart from its religious aspects, it's a party of people who are merchants and small businessmen and who have suffered from the system of elite control. And they understand that, uh, to use the American uh, phrase, government has to get off the backs of small businesses. Equally important to the business climate is clarity and rules about uh, the enforcement of contracts and the enforcement of uh, business arrangements. And ultimately, this is something that needs to be embedded at the highest level in the Constitution itself. Most countries, well, Tunisia and Egypt are, are struggling now to create constitutions. There's a lot of um, jockeying, political jockeying about uh, how those constitutions will turn out. Uh, there are questions that have to be sorted out by the people of these countries, and whether in fact there will be a, what we would call a separation of church and state, uh, or whether there will be some aspects of the state that uh, embed religion in the state. That has to all be dealt with. But they need to bear in mind as they go forward that the rule of law is key to commerce, and that until they finish this process and have constitutions, there will be uncertainty that will undermine uh, the business community. They need to enhance the labor market. Youth unemployment in the region ranges from um, 18 to 30 percent, if you look at uh, Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, and Tunisia. 
In Egypt, 650,000 youngsters enter the labor force every year. Women, of course, face a particular problem in securing employment with only a quarter of women holding jobs in, Egypt, in, in, those same, in, uh, in Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, and Libya. Moreover, the public sector, as I mentioned earlier, dominates the job market. They are the principal hire of people coming out of school. And labor laws are rigid, so it's hard for companies to uh, hire and fire. They need to improve education. The labor force needs more education and greater technical skills, especially in engineering and science. The education system has been very focused on helping people join the civil service, and it needs to be changed to help people join private companies. They need to facilitate access to finance. Another major constraint on economic growth in the Arab countries in transition is the lack of finance for companies. Private credit mainly goes to the big companies. Only 10% of firms use bank finance as uh, their means of finance. This is the lowest share of bank finance for any region in the world. And coming back to a subject I spoke about, they need to replace untargeted subsidies with a modern safety net. The, 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 um, there are uh, so many subsidies that accrue to the upper quintiles of the income spectrum that uh, the budget funds are not available for the things the country needs. And they need to make that adjustment, replacing um, uh, the subsidies with uh, targeted subsidies, cash transfers, so that the people who are poor have protection, uh, but that the resources that uh, so far have been used to give subsidies that accrue to the upper quintiles in the income is spent on are put to better use. And they need to explain clearly that the subsidy savings will be used for more valuable investments uh, so that uh, this will be able to gain acceptability. It's a very politically sensitive subject, obviously. Unfortunately for the MENA region, um, countries have to embark on all of these difficult reforms in these six areas. Uh, but they they have to do it at a time where they have the short run problem of stabilizing their economies. And that's because the process of change that's been underway has been very disruptive. And the, the lack of clarity about the direction, the political direction, has created a lot of uncertainty. So we've seen capital outflows from countries that have uh, sapped the foreign exchange reserves of central banks. We've seen pressures on the exchange rate. Uh, we've seen, uh, in, in some cases, inflation rising. And all of those stabilization issues have to be dealt with in order to create a basis for advancing the structural agenda. Policymakers face the immediate challenge of trying to satisfy people's high expectations, and there are many, but taking on the tough decisions that will be necessary to bring budgets under control and provide some stabilization and protection for the uh, public finances. And the finances are really quite weak bank systems. Now, worse yet, the state of the, of the world makes stabilization even more difficult. You could say that, uh, that the many countries picked a lousy time to have a revolution, in the sense that they're, they're facing a slowing world economy. Uh, uncertainty is coming from what's going on in Europe high food and fuel prices worldwide, the conflict in Syria, with its deplorable loss of life. All of these things uh, add uh, pressures that are very difficult and make uh, uh, the country very fragile. At the IMF, we're trying to help countries with the stabilization task. Now, we think that they're making progress. We're expecting a moderate recovery for the Arab countries in transition in 2013 to some growth. But the growth will be by no means be strong enough to uh, help them make inroads into the high unemployment uh, or to grow in a way over time uh, that will allow them to satisfy the uh, aspirations of the people. Moreover, in the short run, their uh, countries have been, countries' finances have been uh, attenuated 
and they need, um, we reckon, about $33 billion of financing in the course of next year. Money that will most likely not come from private, uh, this is financing from outside. Uh, money that will probably not come from private investors. So they will need extensive support from their bilateral partners, countries in the, in the Gulf, the United States, Europe, um, and loans from international financial institutions um, like us. They will, as we go forward, we are going to be providing with them with support, but as they go forward, they will, in order to stabilize, have to tackle their uh, immediate problem, which is their fiscal uh, deficits. Uh, countries have used subsidies and used fiscal spending to try to appease populations uh, right after the revolution started in order to uh, try to show some immediate gains from the revolution to people. Uh, but in doing so, they pushed budget deficits up to an average of 9% across the region, not counting Libya, which has a lot of uh, oil in it. So its finances are not the same. But they won't be able to uh, progress on that unless they address the subsidy issue that I, that I mentioned. So let me say a word or two about how uh, important, how central, but how difficult that issue is. Last year, the price subsidies in the MENA countries amounted to about $210 billion, which is about 7% uh, of the country's GDP. The truth is that the, these subsidies don't actually uh, uh, protect the poor. The Prime Minister of Egypt, uh, Ishan Kandil, has pointed out that a third of the subsidies in Egypt benefit the wealthiest one-fifth of the population. He didn't mention, but, and of course, those are the people who can afford cars and air conditioners, so they use more energy, so they get more benefits from the subsidy because they have bigger consumers. And the subsidies are uh, conveyed via uh, prices. Our research at the IMF shows that the poorest 20% actually only get 7% of all the subsidies. So this, this, these subsidy programs really aren't uh, to protect the poor. They really have, have served, uh, as I mentioned earlier, as a political purpose. And it's important that that be uh, dealt with and that it be dealt with uh, soon enough to help play a role in stabilizing the economic situation. In many countries, in Egypt, for example, uh, the government, uh, the president and the government, uh, with its backing from uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, are eager to take on this subject. They realize this is a remnant uh, Faustian bargain from the earlier regime they want to begin to make change. So, in sum, the, uh, the transformation that's taking place is taking place under very adverse economic circumstances, both in countries and in terms of the global setting, and the outcome is uncertain. Countries have been understandably focusing on political reform, uh, and a little bit on securing macroeconomic stability. They've made some accomplishments, but they really haven't moved on yet to the more bigger and more um, enduring issue of how to carry out a comprehensive effort to uh, transform the economy. I think when one considers the two undesirable paths that I started with, the deterioration and restoration, it's clear that for them, but also for uh, the global, uh, for the international community, that it's important that we reach the third um, path of transformation. And that the, institute, that the international community should devote a considerable effort to providing the financing, the trade access, the policy advice, whatever else they may need to help them achieve that. At the IMF, we're trying to step up to the challenge. We've been deeply engaged with a number of countries in the region, advising them on how to manage these short-run shocks and uh, how to protect the poor people through the transition. Uh, we have shifted from giving advice to helping with financing. In the last year alone, we've provided uh, committed uh, to loans of eight and a half billion dollars combined for Jordan, Morocco, and Yemen. We have a team in. Uh, we have teams actually right now in uh, Egypt and in Tunisia uh, talking about what more we can do. In Egypt and Yemen, we're talking
talking about uh, uh, ways in which we could provide the financial assistance. In Tunisia, we're for now principally giving advice. Yemen is a much more complex country, which has not only uh, stabilization problems that derive from uh, the um, departure of President Saleh and the disruptions that happened at that point, but they have uh, just a, a, a quite substantial challenges going forward in a country that is uh, running out of uh, oil, its principal uh, export uh, product, and uh, where water is being depleted, water resources are not uh, uh, on the scale that we keep up with the uh, needs of the population. They have very substantial longer term issues. We find uh, that as we re-engage with this region after a long time of not being present, we have to explain again the role of the IMF and how we work. There's a lot of suspicion about uh, the motives of uh, the Western countries uh, in wanting the IMF to come in to help. Uh, we have to explain, as we have been, that we want to try to support the efforts that countries and their people choose to make. We can give advice, we can try to explain to them the consequences of different Past they may choose, and uh, if they choose a path towards transformation, we can uh, help them to stabilize and get on the way. But really, the best we can do is help them stabilize and create a climate conducive to reform. But we really can't, we're not the institution to shepherd the many countries through their transformation itself, which will surely be a long and complicated process. So, let me end with a few thoughts about what the international community more broadly. The task is really very great and we all must do our part. We need to see the G8 countries, you know, US, Europe, uh, Canada, Japan, the regional partners including the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, uh, the international uh, and regional development banks, the World Bank, Asian, uh, the African Development Bank, uh, and even now the uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which is located here can all help play a role. I think the US and Europe need to hold out the prospect of deep market access for trade in both products and services to any country in the region that's willing to undertake fundamental transformations because that will help um, motivate the catalytic effect that I was speaking about to encourage countries to make the reforms that they need to make. The region also needs investment including with support and perhaps enhancements from bilateral and regional partners. The US, European countries have investment uh, uh, agencies that can provide guarantees or one way or another uh, provide uh, uh, support so that private investors have a little more safety than they might other have, otherwise have. And that those investments can help jumpstart growth and show what's possible. <coughs> The, I mentioned the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. It was, a tr it was a, in a sense, a trailblazer in the work it did in Central and Eastern Europe, going into countries where the private sector wouldn't go, uh, leading investors into new sectors, uh, helping to privatize banks, uh, helping to show the way. And I think there are, uh, there's a parallel in um, uh, the MENA region, that the EBRD, which is now changing its charter so that it can operate in the MENA region and uh, help catalyze uh, investment and uh, in the same way show the way. The DOVO partnership, which is a, was, was established by the G8, but has been broadened so that uh, all the interested countries, including Turkey, including uh, the Gulf uh, countries, anyone who wants to help uh, can uh, uh, cooperate together to help the MENA region. They, so far, they've made some efforts, but they uh, really haven't uh, delivered on the promises and commitments that they've made. And it's important that uh, the UK, uh, as it uh, takes over the uh, chairmanship of the G8, uses its presidency to uh, push forward the work of the Dover process. Uh, they have, uh, you know, they have uh, the theme, open economies, inclusive growth, under their presidency. It's a very applicable theme for the countries in the region. The Middle East and North African region is unique. Each country will need to chart its own path, 
But I think uh, there are insights that can be gleaned from other transformations that we have observed. In Central and Eastern Europe, after the fall of communism, the prospect of EU membership held out a powerful promise that served as a political and economic anchor. That helped to orient the transformation of uh, those countries to become market-based economies, to become democracies. Turkey also provides a very inspiring example for, for them. It's a Muslim country that's chosen basic economic reform and it's become a vibrant emerging market country. It's a success story. It has a strong and vibrant middle class. There too, the prospect of EU membership uh, provided the initial impetus to reform. In the Middle East and North Africa, the strong economic external anchor really is missing. There's no group that they can join. So it's really time, in, in, in lieu of that, for a dynamic dialogue with political and thought leaders in the many countries about their economic future. A dialogue that can help lead to a roadmap, to a transformation strategy that can channel people's energy toward a common goal. The process of defining the reform agenda has to really be truly participatory. It has to draw on all of the different uh, stakeholders. We as the IMF talk to people across uh, party lines, across the political spectrum, across social divides. Now it's not something that so much was done in the past, but it's absolutely important because reform plans, no matter how technically sound, cannot be imposed without broad popular understanding and acceptance. An economic strategy can't be successful unless it's part of a successful political strategy. So in closing, I believe that it's clear that the Middle East stands at a historic crossroads and we will all come to regret a failure to rise above our own preoccupation and engage with the people of that region. During its golden age, which lasted 500 years, the Middle East possessed enormous economic power with commerce, communications, and transport that reached across Europe, Africa, and Asia. Ibn Battuta, a 14th century explorer from Tangier, who's traveled, who traveled all across what was then the, the Muslim world, including what we think of as Middle East, Africa, most of Asia. And his travels probably uh, exceeded in scale, even uh, rather substantially exceeded in scale, those of Marco Polo acknowledged the power of openness and engagement when he wrote, if you're a son of the land of the West and you seek success, then head for the land of the East. Today, the West needs to reach out to the East, just as the East needs to reach out to the West. And only by traveling together will we see meaningful modernization and integration for the Middle East and North Africa. I think that uh, this is a region that deserves our support and uh, the time for us to act. I think there is, as, as I said, you know, 
know, studying these authors, there are some who look at the situation now and they see a darkening horizon. Um, we don't know whether that's the right judgment or whether uh, it will take, just take a while for countries to sort out the direction in which they want to go. I can tell you myself, I was personally rather deeply involved in the transitions in Eastern Europe. And if you asked in the first or the second year of those transitions how it would turn out, it would have seemed relatively unlikely that they were going to succeed. Whereas now, when we look back from 20 some odd years later, it seems inevitable that they would march monotonically in the right direction. So and the answer is I don't know. And it probably will vary from country to country. But I'll say a few things. I, as I said before, I don't think there's any inherent reason why the um, political parties that have a religious affiliation can't choose um, to uh, have uh, functioning capitalist economies that are open to international trade. There is nothing in the, in the history or the uh, uh, interest of the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, that would lead to believe that, 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 that they would favor something other than commerce. It's a party people who are engaged in commerce. Um, so I, you know, I, don't, I don't think that one should draw uh, a negative uh, conclusion starting. I think we, whether, as you suggest in your question, um, economic modernization and change can affect the course of political transition, I think that's possible. Uh, I wouldn't want to make too much of it. But I think it certainly is, would be, I think the point I'm kind of making in this talk is, I think it is important for the world to open up possibilities so that as countries in the region make their choices, they have a prospect of some good outcomes, where a good outcome would be that people in their country could do business, could sell things in, in the UK, could sell things in Europe, could sell things in the United States. I think uh, you want to illuminate the good path, the third path, and uh, then people can make their own choices. Hi, sorry, I don't remember. Um, you say that the talks with Egypt are active, but how close are you actually to you? You know, the talks aren't over until they're over, so I don't really have a way of, uh, of characterizing them. Well, we have been, let, me, let me finish. We, um, we've been having discussions with the Egyptian government for, you know, for quite some time. We were close to agreement with them on an economic program in 2011. And at that point, the country was being run by the Supreme Council of the, of the uh, Armed Forces. And they decided that, for various reasons, during their period of rule, they didn't want to have uh, engagements, uh, contracts, uh, borrowing arrangements with the international financial institutions, neither the IMF nor the World Bank. So that was put on hold. We now have had discussions with uh, uh, this newly elected government in um, Egypt. And the truth is that the, what takes time is what ought to take time. We said to them, you need to know what you want to do. You need to make your own program. You have to be home and You have to decide that it's something you want to undertake. You're willing to back politically. You're willing to explain to your people. So they spent really quite a considerable amount of time putting thought to that. We had some discussions along the way, and they now decided uh, on things they wish to do, and they invited us back, and we had discussions. And so uh, I would characterize these as very uh, uh, fruitful discussions. But as I said, when you're when you're negotiating in this, in this uh, setting, you know, it's just not over until it's over. Uh, John, I think that's not good. Good afternoon, Hello. my name is Thank you very much for the presentation, Dr. Sipton. Um, now, in recent months, we have had much encouragement and talk on the uh, topic of Malawi integration from Washington and Brussels. Um, I was wondering how you feel or how you see this integration being realized in, in light of the ongoing dispute between Algeria and Morocco over the Western Sahara and the economic trade structure between the EU and the Malawi region, particularly the bilateral arrangements of the trade. Thank you very much. I, mean, I, I uh, couldn't go into great detail on the speech, but there's a whole history of 
both the U.S. and Europe, especially Europe, negotiating trade arrangements with countries in the region. I don't mean to slight that. I think there are some quite important trade arrangements that have already been made. Um, but I think that we are now entering a period where the countries in the region need the prospect of something new. And they need it not, they need it principally from Europe because of the proximity and with the low transport costs of you know, already very large fraction of exports, tourism, remittances for the region pertain to Europe, not the United States. You know, that could be because of barriers, but I think it's mainly because of proximity, cultural links, etc. So it's, it's really very important that Europe move to a new phase of discussion and put things on the table that go beyond what's been discussed before. To me, the, the, um, you know, the, uh, the right thing to do is to chart the path and say to countries, you can go down that path as you transform. And the prospect is that if you really transform rather completely, you can have really rather complete uh, access. There's surely some, uh, some economic trade-off between immigration and trade. I think that, uh, History and analysis of other countries and regions shows that. Uh, but I think the principal reason for Europe and for the United States to do this is, uh, is broader. I think it would, it would uh, create a basis of uh, the most, I think, the most fortuitous circumstances for the people in the region eventually to fulfill their aspirations. And that's something we should do. Yeah. In the way back, in the the woman, yeah. And then the man. Um, I want to ask you, speaking uh, about Jordan, Jordan is one of the countries that has gone uh, through transformation as the other thing. Um, and indeed, the economic growth can most probably be traced back to the European Depression, massive effects of oil prices, especially after the cutoff of Egyptian gas. Um, and pro cyclical fiscal policies of the system for too long. And yet the IMF has just come to an agreement recently with them to issue a standby um, agreement for about 3.2 billion. And I was wondering um, how much of that decision is actually just geopolitical stability, like trying to maintain the stability Jordan within a very turbulent and the bond so it's a good question. I think you answered the question with your first part. We help all our members if they have problems, and you just cited the, the problems Jordan faces. Jordan faces a range of uh, things that have hit it very weak. Jordan has had a pretty good period of economic performance. It, it suffered from, the, the, as you said, the gas cut off. High, I mean, it's not a, a, an oil producing country, it has to import, paying higher oil import. Uh, prices, et cetera, et cetera, all the things you mentioned are relevant. So we're trying to help them through the period of adjusting to and dealing with those problems. Now, while it's a country that hasn't changed its government, its leadership, or its structure, they have, they have a new prime minister. They are trying to uh, uh, find ways to uh, reform, and you know, we, we, we certainly want to help them have as good and stable a foundation for making any decisions in that. There is a fellow right behind her. Hi. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned Turkey as a potential beacon for development and growth in the Middle East and uh, the Africa region. So I was wondering whether you saw Turkey as um, changing its focus in the future towards that region and moving away from Europe. And I was wondering if you saw um, whether it be any uh, potential difficulties in the fact that it's a more secular nation, they speak a different language from um, other countries in that, many other countries in that region. So, yeah. Turkey is, in a lot of respects, a unique country. It is clearly done very well in trading with and integrating with Europe. But economically, it's also, with, with let's call it a, a Western Europe, it's also be, been very successful in integrating with Central Europe, the Balkans. Uh, it is economically integrating with Central Asia. Um, it's obviously had a long time links and uh, history interacting with countries in the Middle East. Um, you know, whether it serves as a beacon in the sense of a, of a, of a uh, Example that Middle Eastern and North African countries will want to follow. I don't, I don't mean to suggest.
suggested I may have a sociological assessment, but I think that when, when we think of it, uh, I was thinking of it more just in terms of the example that it shows of how uh, the anchor that uh, Europe provided uh, helped catalyze change, a very important change in, uh, in Turkey. Now, at the same time, it's true that Turkey has an interest in the Middle East and North Africa. They have sent many, I mean, their prime ministers visited extensively. They've sent many uh, government officials, trade delegations, investment delegations. And so they see themselves as having um, economic interests in the Middle East and North Africa. And I suspect uh, that they, for various reasons, will be uh, very successful. There was a question, question from the FN. Um, how much corruption and spending on oh, 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 spending on defense a barrier to those economies improving and getting out of the trajectory they are currently going to that in as far as going to I mean I think that uh, it's very hard for me to make any judgment about the extent of uh, corruption after the revolution, but then we all have our views about what was uh, what was uh, embedded in the old system. But I think it's very hard to, to have much information. But I would say that we feel that when you look at a country that's got a problem with stabilization, you really have to look at all the variables. And so you know, all spending items should be examined, whether the tax system is equitable, whether it's efficient, um, whether the subsidies are crippling, we, we really need to look across the spectrum. And, uh, you know, so I, I don't think that any uh, any spending or, or revenue item is in some sense off the table. Countries will have to make their ultimately make their own decisions about the priorities and the of spending items. Uh, one would hope that uh, there will be uh, a very substantial focus going forward on economic transformation and opportunity, and there just won't be the need for the kind of defense expenditure that we saw in the past, but whatever you know. I know you've been too, too generous with your time, but we can keep going all evening, I suspect. <coughs> I would like you to keep to your, you know, okay. time for other appointments. So would it be okay if you take one more question? Sure. And then can I ask you a question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two more questions. First, the woman might have done something. Thank you, Dr. Freer, and this talk. Um, I just want to ask you a question. Speaking about encouraging the uh, private sector and bringing uh, the local economy in the inner region into the global sphere, do you think that IMF in this very moment, while the tension, the political tension in the Middle East is not over yet, is really capable and willing, and does it have a vivid plan, a short-term plan, or short or in the long term, to offer to the MENA um, region um, such channels, mechanisms, or tools to help them or assist to bring that uh, private, that local private sector globally? It's a very good question. I think the bottom line is we can get the ball rolling, but then others really have to push it along. As I say, I think countries have a difficult starting point until they can eliminate the uncertainties that exist, stabilize finances that have been unstable. It's very hard to see private investment coming. Until they, so, but if, if we build that base of stability, it gets the ball rolling. But what's needed beyond that, I, I think even, even then, the private sector, both in country, people uh, you know, we need to, deploy investment dollars, uh, making commitments for long, the long term, foreigners coming in investing for the long term. I think even that will be uh, problematic until the countries are committed to transformation, until they are committed to openness and integration, and until the international community uh, reciprocates. I think that those investors will need some enhancements along the way. So I think this is a kind of a in a sense, a relay where we can get the ball rolling, but then we have to, we the IMF have to hand off to others the task of uh, helping countries uh, uh, go down the road of uh, transformation. 
Thank you. Um, if I could just ask one question. The, I pick up on, on two of the points you raised, which include the youth unemployment problem and the need for private investment. Now, the MENA region is symmetrically placed relative to other parts of the world where there is now a perception that there are too many old people, not enough young people, and where that are sitting on masses of funds and liquidity ready to invest, to move away from uh, paper assets to hard foreign investment. I'm thinking of the East in particular, and China especially. Um, as you know, the IMF's own numbers tell us that parts of the Gulf, Kuwait, UAE, etc., now export six times to developing Asia, what they do to either the EU or the US. Those are parts of the world where there are too few young people, too many old people. They are awash in liquidity, ready to invest. Do you see the possibility for the emergence of a different kind of access, different kind of cluster of um, cooperation and trade in the global economy that actually moves the MENA region away from Western First, I thought you were going to propose the co-op plan for people from the Middle East to go work in Japan and solve their mm -hmm. international problems. I'm happy to claim that <laughs> no, I, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. I've, I've been focused in this talk around in Europe, so I'm focused on what Europe can do. But there is no question that uh, uh, Gulf countries could play a role with and uh, you know, they are playing a role now in the financing of stabilization. Uh, but uh, you're right that they have huge investable resources coming from energy. And uh, I imagine that they'll uh, play a role in the investment process. Um, and they are part of the global partnership. And there's no question that uh, that is broader than just uh, the U.S. and Europe. I was focused uh, mainly on uh, the trade market access, where I think for now uh, the countries in the region are looking to vote to the U.S. and Europe. But it is also tried and safe, but uh, intra regional trade in the Middle East is the lowest of any region in the world. Um, there are some reasons for that that, aren't, uh, that have to do with resource allocation, but a lot of it does have to do with market access. And there's no question that uh, the purchasing power elsewhere in the region is strong enough that uh, uh, trade integration within the region is also important. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.